Okay, so um, if you haven't taken the exam yet, uh, please remember not to procrastinate too much. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time uh, in the testing center. Uh, today we are starting a new unit of the class. Our next uh, three chapters, uh, 26, 27, and 28, are on biomolecules, uh, organic molecules that are important in nature, important in biochemistry for various reasons. Uh, in this chapter, we're focusing on amino acids, peptides, and proteins. Uh, then we'll cover carbohydrates uh, in chapter 27 uh, and lipids in chapter 28. So the nice thing about this section of the class is that there's very little new concepts or new chemistry in these three chapters. We're mostly applying concepts and reactions that we've already learned in class to these biomolecules. So these chapters provide a nice review of concepts we've learned earlier, uh, helping us get ready for the final exam. So today we're going to introduce amino acids. We will talk about their structures, their acid-base properties. Uh, we'll talk about how to uh, synthesize and in some cases separate them. Uh, and then we'll conclude uh, with a brief introduction into peptides. So, um, most of you are probably familiar with amino acids to some degree. You've probably seen them before in other classes. Uh, we did mention them back in chapter 29, or chapter 19, sorry. Uh, and it, I've drawn the general formula for an amino acid here on the board. Uh, we have our amino group, our carboxylic acid group, and then we have some sort of a side chain. I've drawn stereochemistry here. Uh, because 19 of the common 20 amino acids are chiral, and they all exist with the same configuration. And for 18 of those 19, this is S, and for one of those 19, this is R. You might ask, how is that possible? How could you have the same configuration and have it be S for most of the molecules, but R for one? Well, it has to do with the way we determine priority of groups using the Kahn-Ingold prelog system for stereochemistry. If we look at cysteine here on this uh, figure, cysteine has a sulfur in its side chain, so that makes the side chain carbon a higher priority than the carboxylic acid carbon. So the priority switch of two of the groups and the RS designation switches compared to the other amino acids where the side chain is the third priority group on the carbon instead of the second. Okay, so it's just a quirk of the rules that uh, the natural enantiomer of cysteine is R, whereas it is S for uh, the others, okay? So you'll notice if you look at this figure, this has our 20 common amino acids. Uh, and again, you've probably seen these before. Uh, if you're wondering if you need to memorize the structures, the answer is yes, you do. Uh, so in this section of the class, the criteria for whether or not we need to memorize something is, is it important in biochemistry? Uh, and all 20 of the common amino acids are important in biochemistry, so you need to know the structures and you need to know the three-letter abbreviations. Okay, this, this figure here, I apologize that it's not very high resolution. It's kind of fuzzy for some reason, but it's in your textbook. So uh, you can look at the one in your textbook. We have here the structures, and we have the three letter abbreviations and the one letter abbreviations. Biochemists tend to like the one letter abbreviations. Organic chemists tend to like the three letter abbreviations. So in this class, we're going to use the three letter abbreviations. Uh, and those are easier, they all make sense. Uh, but with there being uh, 20 amino acids, 20 common amino acids, and only 26 letters in the alphabet, uh, it's inevitable uh, that we have some bizarre single letter abbreviations that don't make much sense. So you, don't, you may need to learn those for other classes, uh, but not for this class. So you don't need to worry about why K is lysine, why D is aspartic acid. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. We're just going to do the three letter abbreviations and the structures. And again, this is not just an exercise uh, in futile memorization. Uh, this is important memorization because the structures of these amino acids, the structures of the groups in the side chains, 
are vital in determining their properties and their roles in biochemical processes. So uh, I've drawn for you some of the unique amino acids on the board. Uh, we have glycine. Glycine is our only achiral amino acid where R is simply a hydrogen atom. We have proline. Uh, proline is our only amino acid that has a secondary amine instead of a primary amine. And that is because the side chain forms a ring with the amino group. Then over here on this board, we've got isoleucine and threonine. These are our two amino acids that have stereocenters in the side chains. So how many total stereoisomers would we have for each of these amino acids? We would have four, exactly. Okay, so two pairs of diastereomers, and only one of those four uh, stereoisomers is abundant in nature. The other ones exist to very, very small degrees. Um, one of those minor three is more prominent than the others, uh, but there is uh, one major, major uh, stereoisomer in both of those cases. Okay, uh, so let's go back to our figure here that has our uh, 20 uh, common amino acids uh, in it, and it's divided into three categories, uh, neutral amino acids, acidic amino acids, and basic amino acids, and this is related to the properties of the side chain. If the side chain functional groups are neutral uh, at neutral pH, it's in this big category, uh, if you have acidic functional groups in the side chain that are then going to be uh, deprotonated, present as the conjugate base, at physiological pH are going to be here, and there's just two of those. Uh, and then you have your basic amino acids with uh, basic functional groups that would be protonated uh, at neutral pH. Uh, those are in this category. Uh, we could divide the uh, neutral amino acids further into polar and nonpolar. Uh, some of those side chains are nonpolar. Glycine, of course, with just a hydrogen. Uh, and then the ones that have just alkyl groups like alanine or leucine or phenylalanine. Uh, and then those are the nonpolar ones. Uh, and then the polar ones uh, would be uh, ones like tyrosine, threonine, serine, uh, and so forth. Okay. So um, as far as memorizing these structures, uh, there's 20 of them, but the, the process is not as daunting as it may seem at first glance because many of the structures are related to each other. For example, alanine and phenylalanine are very closely related. As the name suggests, you simply stick a phenyl group on alanine and you've got phenylalanine. Okay, so that one, that's easy. Those two are very easy to learn. Uh, then we have aspartic acid down here, uh, and up here we have asparagine. Asparagine is simply the primary amide derived from aspartic acid. In the same way, glutamine is simply the primary amide derived from glutamic acid. Okay, uh, And then there were some students uh, years ago in class who made an extra credit music video that was very clever. It was an extra credit music video containing a bunch of mnemonic devices for memorizing the structures of amino acids. Uh, and you can uh, view that on Learning Suite. If you go to the music video page in Learning Suite, uh, you'll see a bunch of documents with links, and then you'll see one MOV file, and that one MOV file that you can click on directly uh, is the music video with all these mnemonic devices for um, learning the, the names and structures of amino acids. And it's very clever. Uh, the one that really sticks in my mind that they said uh, is in the cysteine chapel, you say shh, right? Cysteine has a thiol and SH in the side chain. Uh, so that's a very easy one to remember. Uh, although I've been to the cysteine chapel and it's not very quiet because there's a lot of tourists there, uh, but in theory it should be. Uh, so, um, I've already taught you uh, a quarter of the amino acids uh, in, in about uh, three or four minutes now. So uh, it's not as bad as it seems. If you make flashcards, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions about our structures of amino acids? Okay, let's talk about their acid-base properties now. 
Uh, we uh, introduced this in chapter 19, and we will uh, cover it in more detail now. So uh, we know that amino acids at neutral pH do not exist in the way I've drawn them on the board. Rather, they exist as their zwitter ions or their internal salts. They look like this. Uh, by now, hopefully, you recognize that an amine and a carboxylic acid are going to react in an acid-base reaction, uh, giving you an ammonium ion and a carboxylate. Uh, and so that's what we have, an ammonium ion and a carboxylate at neutral pH. Okay? If we add acid, if we lower the pH, uh, then we're going to protonate the carboxylate of our zwitter ion. And we'll end up with the, the conjugate acid of our zwitter ion, which has a positive charge. Um, and you'll see uh, this dominates at pH 2. The pKa of the carboxylic acid of an amino acid uh, is usually a little bit higher than 2. Okay. Now, I know I've told you you don't need to memorize pKa values, but you've probably heard the pKa value of acetic acid enough times that some of you might know it. Is the carboxylic acid of an amino acid more acidic or less acidic than acetic acid? And even if you don't know the number, you can look at the structures. Look at the, the conjugate base and, and, and see if you can figure out if the carboxylic acid of an amino acid is more acidic or less acidic than acetic acid. Maybe we should have made an eye clicker question out of this. More acidic or less? Okay, I'll give you a hint. We have an ammonium ion here in this conjugate base, that's going to play a role uh, in whether the, uh, the carboxylic acid is more acidic or less acidic. Okay, Trent? More, more acidic, why? Okay, we have a positively charged nitrogen close to our negatively charged carboxylate. So inductively, that positively charged nitrogen can stabilize the negatively charged carboxylate. So if we have inductive stabilization of the conjugate base, then that would make the acid more acidic. Okay? So indeed, the uh, carboxylic acids of amino acids are about 100 times more acidic than acetic acid. Acetic acid's pKa is uh, 4.7, 4.8. Uh, and then this uh, pKa is usually 2 point something. So we're talking about two orders of magnitude difference. All right, and then if we add base to our zwitter ion, we raise the pH, we're going to end up deprotonating the nitrogen. <laughs> and that will give us the conjugate base of our amino acid, which will have a minus one charge. The pKa of our ammonium ion uh, is usually going to be a little bit below 10. It says approximately 10 here. Most of them are like 9.5, 9.7, somewhere in that range, okay? That pKa value is a little bit lower than the pKa values for most ammonium ions, okay? For reference, ammonium itself, NH4 plus, is 9.8. And when we have a primary amine, the, the ammonium ion from a primary amine is usually in the 10s. It's usually like 10 and a half or something like that. Okay, so that means this nitrogen is slightly less basic than ammonia and a bit less basic than a normal primary amine. And the reason for that is also going to be the inductive effect. If we look at the, uh, the conjugate acid here, we see that uh, even though this carboxylate is negatively charged, the carbonyl carbon of our carboxylate has a partial positive charge on that carbonyl carbon. And that partial positive charge on the carbonyl carbon is withdrawing electrons from the nitrogen, making the nitrogen less basic. We can see it better over here. This is our nitrogen. It has its lone pair. Uh, but because we have uh, this partial positive charge here on the carbon, 
that inductively withdraws electrons from the nitrogen, making it less electron rich, less basic. Not a huge effect, less than an order of magnitude, uh, but it does make this nitrogen a bit less basic than ammonia. Questions? Okay, so we have a figure here that is not in the textbook, but it's an important figure, so uh, you'll want to take a look at it on Learning Suite uh, and make sure you understand uh, what we're seeing here in this figure. This is a titration curve. You've probably seen titration curves in other classes. This is the only time I think you'll see one in this class, uh, but it is important. So at the left here, we're starting with the fully protonated, this is a titration curve for glycine. So at pH zero, high acid concentration, uh, we're going to have the conjugate acid of glycine, the cation version, the fully protonated version, okay? Uh, as we start to add base and we're moving right on this figure, which functional group are we going to deprotonate first? Carboxylic acid, good. You do not deprotonate the positively charged nitrogen because the carboxylic acid is more acidic. So we deprotonate our carboxylic acid. That's gonna give us our zwitterion. When we have added half an equivalent of base, we should have a one-to-one -one mixture of the acid, the conjugate acid, and the zwitterion. Okay, right here at this point, one-to-one -one mixture of these components. <clears throat> if we look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation tells us that when we have a one-to-one -one mixture of an acid and a conjugate base, the pH of that solution is going to equal the pKa of that acid. So we can measure the pH uh, when we've added half an equivalent of hydroxide, and that's going to be the pKa of that carboxylic acid, and it happens to be 2.34, okay? All right, we keep adding hydroxide, and once we get to one equivalent in this range between 0.5 and 1, now the zwitterion concentration is going to be higher than the uh, conjugate acid concentration. We reach one equivalent of base, and the zwitterion concentration is going to be maximized. Right? It's not going to be exclusively the zwitterion, because the zwitterion is involved in two acid-base equilibria. So you'll have a small amount of this, a small amount of that, and a whole bunch of the zwitterion, right? But not completely the zwitterion because there are equilibria involved. So when we add our one equivalent, uh, the, the, the concentration of the zwitterion is at its maximum. The pH at that point is known as the isoelectric point or pi. That just means the isoelectric point. That's a term we introduced to you in chapter 19 the pH at which the zwitterion concentration is at its maximum. The way we would measure it is to do just this, add one equivalent of base, uh, and measure the pH. We can also calculate it. It's simply the average of the two pKa values uh, for this amino acid. Uh, and then we add more base. Once we've added one and a half equivalents, then we should have a one-to-one -one mixture of the zwitterion and its conjugate base. And so the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation tells us uh, that the pH at that concentration is going to be the pKa of our ammonium ion, the functional group that's involved in the acid-base equilibria in this case. So we measure the pH at this point, 9.6. Okay, like I told you, uh, usually pretty close to 9.5 for most of our uh, amino acids, but below the value for ammonia, which is 9.8. Okay. Uh, and then we keep adding base. Once we've added two equivalents of base, uh, then we should have essentially all of our conjugate base and none of our zwitterion, okay? Are there any questions on this titration curve uh, and the acid-base equilibria? So the important skill from this uh, is to be able to predict which form of an amino acid would dominate at a given pH. And this figure is nicely color-coded in this range, uh, although the colors aren't very different, unfortunately, uh, but in this range, this kind of light green range, that's where the conjugate acid is going to dominate. This range in the middle, which is kind of gray, uh, is where the zwitterion dominates. And this region over here to the right, which is blue, is where the conjugate base dominates.
So we have a table in the book of pKa values, uh, which you certainly don't need to memorize. If you need any of these values, they will be given to you. So there's no need to memorize uh, these numbers. Uh, and I told you that you can calculate the isoelectric point by averaging the pKa's of the carboxylate uh, and the ammonium ion. But there are some amino acids that have an acidic or basic functional group in the side chain. So there's a pKa value associated with a functional group in the side chain. Determining the isoelectric point for these amino acids is more complicated. You don't average all three. That doesn't work. What you need to do is identify the version of that amino acid that is the zwitterion, and you average the pKa's on either side of the zwitterion. The pKa's for the two acid-base reactions that the zwitterion is involved in. And that gives you the isoelectric point for an amino acid with an acidic or basic functional group in the side chain. So we'll do a couple examples of this so that we know how to do this. We'll start with aspartic acid. Aspartic acid has a carboxylic acid in its side chain. We're going to write the fully protonated form that would exist at low pH. So all of all three of our acidic functional groups in uh, aspartic acid are protonated at low pH. As we add base, which functional group gets deprotonated? Carboxylic acid, but which one? The one that is closest to the amine. Very good, because that uh, ammonium ion is inductively stabilizing the conjugate base. We know that the inductive effect is dependent upon the distance uh, between the atom in question and the, the, the acidic functional group. This carboxylate, carboxylic acid is closer to the ammonium ion, so it is the more acidic of the two. It's the one that gets deprotonated first. Okay. You'll notice a nice review of some key chapter two concepts uh, in this discussion. Okay. All right, so uh, this is the conjugate base of that. Uh, the pKa value is in the table. Let's go to aspartic acid. We see pKa of the carboxylic acid, 2.1. Okay. We add more base. We're going to deprotonate our second carboxylic acid. Our ammonium ion remains protonated. Okay. So the pKa of the side chain carboxylic acid should be higher than that of the alpha carboxylic acid. We go aspartic acid, 3.86. Okay. Still lower than acetic acid because of the small inductive effect from the nitrogen, uh, but significantly higher than the uh, alpha carboxylic acid. All right, let's raise this up just a touch. Uh, so we continue to add base, and now finally we're going to deprotonate our ammonium ion. And we have our form of aspartic acid that would dominate at high pH. And the ammonium ion of aspartic acid, 9.82. Okay. All right, any questions about this acid-base equilibrium? So now what we need to do to calculate the isoelectric point is to locate the zwitterion. Which of these four species is the zwitterion? The first one, the second one, the third one, or the fourth one? The second one, second one is the neutral species. You're looking for the one that's neutral, where the charges are balanced. That's right here. So then once we've, once we've located the zwitterion, we just need to average the two pKa's 
for the acid-base equilibria involving the zwitterion. So if we've drawn it like this, it's just the two pKa values on either side of the zwitterion. So 2.1, 3.86. Uh, we don't have to do the math because they've done it for us. We look the isoelectric point in the table. It is 2.98. Okay. So when we have an acidic functional group in the side chain, uh, the isoelectric point occurs at a fairly low pH. That's where this bitter ion is going to be maximum in terms of its concentration with aspartic acid. Okay, let's see what this would look like with a basic functional group in the side chain. We'll use lysine as an example of that. Lysine has an amine in the side chain. So at low pH, both of our nitrogens are protonated. Okay. So this is what lysine will look like at a low pH. We're going to add base. We know that our carboxylic, carboxylic acid is the most acidic of these three uh, functional groups. So we're going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid first. Okay. Which of these two ammonium ions do you think is the most, well, before we do that, let's write the pKa up here. Uh, lysine, that should be a pretty standard one in terms of the carboxylate, 2.18. All right, now let's look at these ammonium ions. Which is going to be more acidic? The alpha ammonium or the side chain ammonium? To ask the question another way, if it's not protonated, which of those two nitrogens would be more basic? The one closer to the carboxylate or the one further from the carboxylate? The one further is more basic because we told you that there was an inductive effect making it less basic, right? That this carbonyl carbon has a small partial positive charge. So that inductively would make this nitrogen less basic. So as a result, it's going to be more acidic as the ammonium. So this is the nitrogen that gets deprotonated first. Okay. We'll write that down here. Move that down just a little bit. Okay. We look at the table. Lysine, pKa of the alpha ammonium, 8.95, okay? All right, now the last one we deprotonate is the side chain amine. And we look in the table, side chain amine, 10.53. So indeed, there's a somewhere between a 10 and 100-fold difference in the basicity of those amines. And that's due to that inductive effect. So 10.53. All right. So here are the acid-base equilibria for lysine. Which species is our zwitterion? One, two, three, or four. Three is our zwitterion. That's our neutral species. So we need to average the pKa's on either side of our zwitterion to determine the pI. 8.95 plus 10.53. Again, we don't need to do the math because we have it in, on the board. It's nine point something. Yeah, 9.74, okay? So as we would expect, if we have a basic functional group in the side chain of our amino acid, it raises the isoelectric point, uh, or the point at which this bitter ion uh, is at a maximum concentration. Uh, and then if we have an acidic functional group in that side chain, it lowers the isoelectric point, okay? Any questions?
All right, so again, calculating isoelectric points, determining uh, which version of the amino acid is going to dominate at a given pH. Uh, these are the skills that you need to have uh, in regards to uh, amino acids and their acid-base properties. Let's talk now about how we would synthesize amino acids. Amino acids are very, very important molecules. So we have tons and tons of ways of synthesizing amino acids. We've worked on this in my lab and we continue to work on amino acid synthesis in my lab because peptide chemistry is one of our uh, main interests uh, in the lab. Uh, today, we're only going to focus on three methods uh, which are identical to or very closely related uh, to methods we've already learned for synthesizing amines uh, or carboxylic acids, okay? The first one is going to be an SN2 reaction with excess ammonia. Okay, so if we take a carboxylic acid and that carboxylic acid has an alpha halogen such as a bromine and we react that with excess ammonia Uh, we can suppress polyalkylation. We can just perform a monoalkylation reaction. Now, you'll notice, so this is valine here. You'll notice I drew it as its conjugate base. If we have excess ammonia, we'd have a fairly high pH. Uh, and so we would expect... Uh, to obtain it uh, as the conjugate base rather than this bitter ion. Uh, and it's simply going to be a salt with ammonium because your excess uh, ammonia uh, would just get protonated. Okay, So this is simply an SN2 reaction. It works pretty well. Uh, it actually works well for monoalkylation because this nitrogen is less basic than ammonia in contrast to most primary amines, which are more basic than ammonia. This is less basic because of the inductive effect of that carbonyl carbon, okay? So this is more basic, more nucleophilic than that. So we get a single product. We still use excess for the acid-base chemistry. SN2 reactions, what do we know about their stereochemistry? Inversion, okay? And I've drawn it as inversion. So if we have a single enantiomer of our alpha halo carboxylic acid, we would get a single enantiomer of our amino acid. The problem is it's very, very difficult to obtain these compounds as a single enantiomer. They are usually present as racemic mixtures. So if you have a racemic mixture, each enantiomer undergoes inversion and you end up with a racemic mixture of your product. Okay, so most of the time these are racemic because these are racemic. Questions? All right, our second method we're going to learn for synthesizing amino acids is related to the malonic ester synthesis. We're going to use a special version of the malonic ester, uh, one that has an amide attached. This is called diethylacetamidomalonate, kind of a long name. So this would be diethylmalonate. This is the acetamido portion of the molecule. So what do we do with malonic ester? What kind of reactions? Hopefully you know this. You're really going to need to know it if you haven't taken the exam yet. What do we do with malonic ester? Okay, we alkylate it with alkyl halides, and then we hydrolyze and decarboxylate to give alpha alkylated versions of acetic acid. So we can do the same thing with our diethylacetamidomalonate, uh, but instead of getting aceto acetic acid derivatives at the end, uh, we're going to end up getting amino acid derivatives at the end because we have this nitrogen. Okay. Okay, we're going to get species like this. 
uh, and I've drawn it as the conjugate acid of an amino acid because we use acid in the final step of our malonic ester synthesis. Okay, so here's on the screen just a review. Uh, it's the malonic ester synthesis applied to this special version of malonic ester, diethyl acetamidomalonate. Step one, deprotonate with a strong base like a thoxide. That will completely deprotonate and generate our resonance stabilized intermediate. Step two, alkylation. SN2 reaction with the primary alkyl halide. And then step three, we add acid and heat. Uh, that not only hydrolyzes the esters, that will also hydrolyze this amide. That amide has been used as a protecting group for the nitrogen. And we can now hydrolyze it off. Uh, and then uh, we decarboxylate. We learned the mechanism of that uh, back in uh, chapter 23. Uh, so we get these byproducts, uh, and then uh, we generate the uh, amino acid. Okay, And this shows a specific version of this uh, process being used to synthesize phenylalanine. Okay? So... If you perform this malonic ester synthesis, this special malonic ester synthesis, would you expect to obtain your phenylalanine as a single enantiomer or as a racemic mixture? Racemic mixture. Are any of our starting materials and reactants chiral? No, they are not. So if we form a chiral product, from exclusively achiral reactants, that product will be racemic. Okay? So we would get racemic phenylalanine. Um, we don't have a chiral species until we get to here. Here we have two of the same group attached to, to the carbon. Uh, but then when we perform the decarboxylation, we lose one of the two carboxylic acids as CO2. We have an enol, and that enol gets protonated. That's how we form our stereocenter. And as we protonate that enol uh, in the tautomerization mechanism, we're going to get a racemic mixture. So this will always give racemic product. Okay? We'll always get racemic phenylalanine. I should mention that it would be really, really dumb to use this reaction to make phenylalanine. Because phenylalanine is available in nature as a single enantiomer. Uh, and usually you want the naturally occurring L enantiomer or S enantiomer. Um, and so usually you would do this if you were trying to make an uncommon amino acid with an unusual side chain as opposed to one of the common amino acids, which you would obtain easily from nature. Okay. All right. Our third method that we're learning for synthesizing amino acids is called the Strecker synthesis. And the Strecker synthesis is related to the cyanohydrin reaction that we learned uh, back in chapter 21, okay? So in a Strecker synthesis, much like a cyanohydrin synthesis, we are starting with an aldehyde. We are going to react our aldehyde with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide, okay? That reaction is going to give us a species known as an alpha amino nitrile. Okay. This is what an alpha amino nitrile looks like. It looks an awful lot like a cyanohydrin. It just has an amine as opposed to an OH group. We can treat that alpha amino nitrile with aqueous acid. What happens to the nitrile functional group in the presence of aqueous acid? It hydrolyzes to give a carboxylic acid. Okay. So that's how we form our amino acid. In this case, it's going to be formed as the conjugate acid because we're using acid uh, in this last step. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at this one on the screen because it is mostly a review of mechanisms uh, that we have used previously. So ammonium chloride has its own acid-base equilibrium. It's in equilibrium with ammonia and HCl. Uh, the arrows lie far to the left. 
But all we need is a little bit of ammonia to initiate this process, and that ammonia uh, can attack the carbonyl carbon of our aldehyde. Uh, then the book did not show us the proton transfers, unfortunately, uh, but hopefully we recognize that the HCl would simply protonate the oxygen, and then the chloride in the subsequent step would deprotonate the ammonium ion. Okay, so just two simple proton transfers using HCl and chloride gets us to this point. We've seen this before. This is an intermediate and imine formation. And all we're doing here is making an imine. We learned previously that uh, ammonia uh, or a primary amine in the presence of, of mild acids, meaning a low concentration of HCl in this case, uh, will give you an imine. Okay, so three steps. They didn't show it to us here, but they showed it to us in chapter 21. We're simply going to protonate the oxygen with our HCl, lose water, uh, and then deprotonate the nitrogen with chloride. Okay, and that gives us our imine. Any questions? Yes. Uh, not in this case because um, it's different. Uh, you have different acid-base equilibria than you would if you were using, if you're trying to make a cyanohydrin, okay? Because the ammonia uh, itself is a weak base and this is a weak acid, it allows you to add them together. Um, you might get a little bit of that, but the equilibrium is gonna favor your amino nitrile, especially if you use excess uh, of the ammonium chloride. You, you can force it to go to the amino nitrile. Uh, in that fashion. So then once we have our imine, we, we, we regenerated our HCl in that final deprotonation step to make the imine. So we protonate the nitrogen of our imine, cyanide attacks, uh, and then that gives us our alpha amino nitrile, and then that hydrolyzes to give us our carboxylic acid. Okay. And the mechanism of the hydrolysis not shown here, but that was something we learned in chapter 22. Okay, any questions about this? So would we obtain a racemic product from this or would we obtain uh, an enantiopure amino acid from this Strecker synthesis? Do we have any chiral reagents or starting materials? No, you're shaking your head. So that answers the question for you. Anytime we make chiral products from achiral reactants, they have to be racemic. Now, it is possible to use a chiral catalyst. We, we, uh, we haven't shown that to you here, uh, but you can use a chiral catalyst that would hydrogen bond to the imine instead of protonate it, and you can actually get a single enantiomer. But the version we're teaching you in class would just give you a racemic mixture. So here we have a figure showing the synthesis of methionine using all three of these methods. Uh, and they would all give racemic product, uh, which is not ideal because we want uh, a single enantiomer typically when we are um, synthesizing amino acids. So how would we get a single enantiomer of an amino acid from the synthesis? One thing we could do is a resolution. Resolution refers to the separation of enantiomers. But we have learned previously that enantiomers have the same physical properties of each other. How on earth can we separate molecules that have the same physical properties? We can't. So what we have to do is temporarily convert them into species that have different physical properties, separate them, and then convert them back into the enantiomers once they're separated. And that's what this figure is showing you. If we have a mixture of enantiomers in solution, we can add a single enantiomer of a chiral reagent that reacts with both enantiomers that's going to make diastereomers. AY and BY are going to be diastereomers of each other. Diastereomers have different physical properties, so we're actually going to be able to separate them. Once we do, we run a reaction to remove Y, whatever it is, and that gives us back our enantiomers that are now separate. Okay? 
So this is a three-step process kind of involved, but it does work. So an example of how it specifically works with amino acids is started here on this slide. So we have our racemic alanine. Uh, to resolve an amino acid, the first thing you need to do is protect the nitrogen. So we're going to make an amide from the nitrogen. We're using acetic anhydride in this case. Uh, we should be using pyridine as well in this reaction. Uh, that'll give us the amide uh, of the nitrogen. Uh, then once we have those amides, those are going to be enantiomers of each other. We add a single enantiomer of a chiral amine. Hopefully you've seen this enough by now to know that this amine and these carboxylic acids are just going to react in an acid-base process to make a salt. But the two salts we're going to get are going to be diastereomers of each other because we only have the R enantiomer of our amine. So you'll have SR in one salt and RR in the other salt. Those are diastereomers. Those salts are going to have different physical properties. Usually their uh, solubility properties will be different. So you could uh, add a single solvent. One of those diastereomers will dissolve, stay in solution. Uh, the other one will crystallize out. So then you filter out the one that crystallized. Uh, you concentrate, remove the solvent of the one that didn't, and now you've separated your diastereomers. If you add base, then you're going to neutralize the ammonium ions, protonate your carboxylic acid. You're also going to hydrolyze the acetamides, uh, and then you're going to get your amino acids back uh, and uh, your chiral amine. You can separate from those amino acids. So this is how you would resolve amino acids. Any questions? There's a second resolution process that is known as a kinetic resolution. Right. The word kinetic refers to reaction rates. So here what we're doing is running a reaction that is fast for one enantiomer and slow for the other enantiomer. So one enantiomer gets transformed in the reaction. The other one remains unreacted. What kind of reagents or catalysts would react with one enantiomer and not another. Enzymes, yeah, enzymes would. What property do enzymes have that would allow them to do this? Okay, they're chiral. So you need a chiral catalyst or a chiral reagent to perform a kinetic resolution. It is only a chiral catalyst or chiral reagent that is going to react at different rates with enantiomers. So we have, again, our amides of alanine here. We have enzymes in the body that both form amides and break amide bonds. They react much faster with L-amino acids, naturally occurring amino acids, than the unnatural D-amino acids. So if we take an acylase enzyme, our L-amino acid, L-alanine derived species, is going to react fast. That amide is going to get hydrolyzed fast. The D-amino acid derived amide is going to react very slow. So if you use the right reaction times, you're going to get your L-alanine and then the D-alanine is going to remain as the amide. These species are going to be very easy to separate because they're not even isomers of each other. Okay, So we separate these. If we wanted the D-alanine, then we just hydrolyze that amide in a separate step. So kinetic resolution requires a chiral catalyst. Usually we use an enzyme. Okay, But whenever we perform a resolution, we're throwing away half of our material because usually we only want one of the two enantiomers. So if we're going to synthesize an amino acid, it would be most efficient if we only synthesized the amino acid we wanted. So we would want to perform an enantioselective synthesis. We've seen this a couple of times earlier in the class. We've always used a chiral catalyst or a chiral reagent in this case. It's possible to perform enantioselective hydrogenation reactions. If we hydrogenate certain types of alkenes, we generate stereocenters. If we have a chiral catalyst, we can form one of the two enantiomers selectively. 
And this is a chiral rhodium catalyst. You might ask, how is this chiral? You don't see any stereo centers. This is chiral because you cannot rotate about this carbon-carbon bond because these two phosphine groups are very, very bulky. We can look at a model of this molecule. This molecule is called BINAP. It's shown on this page. This is a molecular model. You see these bulky aryl groups on the phosphorus. There's no way in the world you can rotate about this carbon-carbon bond. And so the mirror images of this molecule are non-superimposable because of what's called axial chirality. We're not going to focus on that. We're just going to note that this is indeed a chiral molecule. So if you have a single enantiomer of your BINAP, which you can actually get either enantiomer uh, without much difficulty, and that chiral ligand is attached to a rhodium catalyst, when that rhodium catalyst promotes a hydrogenation of this particular alkene, one enantiomer will be formed as the major enantiomer, and the other one will be the minor enantiomer, because differences in rates due to the two transition states being diastereomers of each other. I've never seen a reaction that actually gives 100% EE, so I'd be very skeptical about this. Uh, but most of these reactions give greater than 95% EE. So they're giving like uh, 98 to 2 uh, or better ratios uh, of the enantiomers. Okay? Uh, and that's because the transition states leading to each enantiomer are diastereomers because we only have a single enantiomer of our chiral rhodium catalyst. This particular example gave us S-phenylalanine. Uh, that would be dumb in my opinion because S-phenylalanine is readily available in nature. If you wanted R-phenylalanine, which is also known as the D enantiomer in amino acid nomenclature, the one that is much, much less abundant in nature, that's the one it would make sense to synthesize. Or if you were synthesizing amino acids with unusual side chains, uncommon side chains, not the 20 common amino acids. There's absolutely no need to synthesize the S enantiomers or the L enantiomers of your 20 common amino acids. Those are just available from nature. It's only the unnatural enantiomers or the uncommon amino acids that you would synthesize. All right, we'll stop there. Good luck on the exam. We'll talk about peptides next week. Remember, we don't have class on Friday. This is our three-day weekend, our BYU three-day spring break weekend. Don't go crazy. Make sure you stay uh, safe. Uh, and we'll, good luck on the exam if you haven't taken it, and we'll see you on Monday.